Hey folks and welcome back. Uh, so this week we are going to talk about philosophical thought experiments. We're going to spend some time trying to get a sense for how thought experiments are used in philosophical thinking, the variety of ways in which they're used really, and at the same time we're going to use a famous thought experiment, uh, the trolley thought experiment, which many of you have probably encountered in some form or another, probably a meme, uh, and uh, see one of its original applications by Judith Jarvis Thompson uh, in this 1970-something paper, 76, I think, uh, called Killing, Letting Die, and the Trolley Problem, where Thompson tries to determine whether killing is always worse than letting die, or where an act of killing is always worse than an act of letting die. Uh, and she's going to use the trolley problem to advance this investigation. We'll see exactly how in a bit. Uh, before we dive into that, though, I want to spend some time talking about thought experiments more generally. So, where did this idea come from? Well, the, the, very, the term thought experiment uh, was coined, we think, by Ernst Mach, who was a 20, or, um, sorry, a 19th century German philosopher. Uh, he was German, so he called them Gedanken Experiment, which is much more fun to say than thought experiment. It was translated into English as a thought experiment, but that's certainly not where thought experiments get their start. Uh, philosophical thinkers and scientists have been using thought experiments for millennia. Uh, we encounter them in ancient Greek thought, in even pre-Socratic thought, uh, in uh, Zeno, for example, Zeno's paradox, you see Achilles and the tortoise uh, in a race with one another, challenged to a race with one another, and Achilles says, this tortoise, he's, he's slow, it's, this is not going to be a problem, and he uh, tells the tortoise, You'll, I'll give you a head start, and so he gives the tortoise a head start, say, a hundred yards or something, uh, and then Achilles starts. Zeno argues that, in fact, Achilles can't overtake the tortoise, because in order for Achilles to overtake the tortoise, he would first need to arrive at the point at which the tortoise began. But by the time Achilles arrives there, the tortoise will have moved further, further ahead, maybe just a little bit, but further ahead. Uh, and then Zeno would need, or Achilles would need to reach the new point where the tortoise was when he arrived at the initial point where the tortoise was, at which point the tortoise will have moved a little bit ahead. Achilles will have to reach that point before he can overtake the tortoise, but at that point the tortoise will have moved a little bit further ahead, and then Achilles will need to reach that point, and we can see this just keeps going and going. And the problem is supposed to be that Achilles can never overtake the tortoise, but that's paradoxical because clearly Achilles is going to win this race. How does that happen? How's that supposed to work? How do we make sense of that? Uh, a related paradox from Zeno, another thought experiment. Uh, he asks us to uh, consider uh, moving across a space, say moving across a stadium. Uh, and uh, he says in order to move, you have to have a goal, right? You have to be aiming at something, going somewhere. And in order to arrive at that goal, you first need to reach the midpoint. But in order to arrive at that midpoint, which is a new goal, you first need to reach the midpoint between where you are and where that is. And in order to arrive at that new goal, you need to reach the midpoint between where you are and where that is. And we are in an infinite regress where you can never actually reach any point. So locomotion, movement about your space, is not possible. Well, but clearly I can move. So what's going on here? <laughs> These are just some early thought experiments that we uh, encounter in pre-Socratic philosophers. And Zeno is not the only one by any means. Heraclitus asks if we can step in the same river twice. He's not asking us to actually test that. He's asking us to think about it. Uh, Einstein famously wondered what it would be like to ride on a beam of light and what would happen to the beam of light coming from the flashlight that you were holding while you were riding on the beam of light. If the speed of light is the speed limit of the universe, if nothing can go faster than the speed of light, and does the, uh, the light coming out of the flashlight that is traveling at the speed of light 
just go the speed of light? What happens to it? Um, uh, Schrodinger's famous cat uh, is another thought experiment. He didn't actually try killing cats <laughs> uh, to see if they were alive or dead. Uh, he, he, it was a thought experiment he asked us to perform. Uh, the famous brain in a vat thought experiments are yet another uh, that is often used in philosophical uh, in the philosophical literature uh, to think about the possibility of knowing our uh, the, the external world, knowing what exists outside of our own heads uh, or outside of our own experience. Uh, it's possible that you're just a brain in the vat and that there's actually uh, nothing else outside of you, um, that the world that you think you inhabit is not real. Uh, <laughs> it's all just uh, a simulation, a computer simulation of some sort. Uh, it's possible you live in the matrix. Um, and this uh, brain in the vat thought experiment really goes back to Descartes' evil demon uh, thought experiment, where uh, he considers the possibility that there's an evil demon manipulating all of his thoughts, ensuring that every thought he has is mistaken. So that all he can know is that he does exist, but beyond that he can't know anything at all. He can't know anything about what the actual world he lives in is like. Um, these are thought experiments, right? Uh, and uh, we encounter thought experiments in ethics. Uh, like Judith Jarvis Thompson's other famous thought experiment, the violinist thought experiment, uh, where she asks us to consider that one morning we wake up and we find ourselves attached to a famous violinist and the doctor comes in and says, oh yes, you were brought in by the Music Appreciation Society last night. This violinist was about to die and he needed to be attached to your, uh, to your kidneys for nine months. Uh, and uh, you are the only match, you're the only one who can save his life. Is it permissible for you to unplug yourself from the famous violinist? Uh, or do you have some responsibility to remain plugged into the violinist for nine months? She uses this to help us think through uh, our intuitions about abortion, our commitments regarding abortion. So thought experiments have a long history. They're used in many different contexts, not just in philosophy, uh, and they can be used in many different ways and for many different purposes. Uh, in some cases, uh, thought experiments are merely used to elicit an intuition uh, to get us to a shared uh, starting point. In other cases, they are used to advance an argument by, uh, at a certain point in an argument, using a thought experiment to show that something must be the case or that something cannot be the case because of the way this particular thought experiment works out. And in some cases, like Thompson's paper, they constitute the entirety of the argument. She'll use thought experiments to uh, advance you through a series of steps in which you are thinking about uh, what must be the case? What kind of commitments must I have in order for the judgment that I make in this case to make sense and in order to make it make, make it fit with the judgments I make in this other case? Uh, so we use these thought experiments to elicit tensions in our thought and then have to figure out how to resolve those tensions. Um, thought experiments often get pilloried uh, for uh, asking us to think about cases that couldn't possibly happen, asking us to think about things that couldn't possibly be real, or from being under-described, uh, that is, for, uh, for being um, such that too many of the details are missing and we can't actually think through the case. Uh, but these are actually features, not bugs, <laughs> uh, of thought experiments. Uh, they are of course, about things that we couldn't actually test or situations we couldn't actually be in. And they ask us to reflect on how we would judge uh, or what we would judge in that case or how we would behave in that case. Now, sometimes they're too far-fetched. Sometimes we just don't know. And they, they, you, you might read a thought experiment and just think, I have no idea what my response would be. In many cases, though, they're enlightening. They show us how we might respond in a case like the one described. And yes, they are under-described. Yes, they lack detail, but there is a reason for that. It's because 
especially in moral cases, the details of the real world, the details of our actual uh, moral lives are often really complicated, often really messy and really hard to work through. So thought experiments try to focus in on one particular aspect of a case or one or two particular aspects of a case and get us thinking about those. And it might not answer the real world case, right? A thought experiment might not give us a straightforward answer about a real world case, but it might help us to think more clearly about some aspect of that case so that when we do encounter the real messy world that we live in, we can at least be clear about a part of what our commitments are with regard to this decision that needs to be made. All right, so that's a little bit about thought experiments. We'll talk more about them when we meet this week. In the next lecture, I'll pick up with Thompson's own arguments.